Hello, welcome to Maths Kitchen. I'm James and this is episode 11 in my 20 week series, which is all about helping you to do as well as you possibly can in your GCSE maths exam. This week is all about common mistakes that occur, but common mistakes that you may well not realize that you're making. So you'll know if you've seen any of the previous episodes that what I encourage you to do to get better at maths is just to practice lots of maths and there's loads of different ways you can do that and I go through lots of those in previous episodes. One of the ones that I keep coming back to obviously is to encourage you to go to my website mathskitchen.com. There's loads of free stuff there. You can search through thousands of questions and you can search by topic or by level of difficulty or just by the general area. Is it geometry, algebra? and so on. And then there's also a daily workout that you can do that will give you sort of five or six questions each day, random questions. They're going to help you just give you that daily practice that is really, really going to help you. But there, there are, of course, loads of other places that you can practice as well. Um, and if you want to sign up, we offer lots more than that as well. If you're interested in signing up for the premium membership um, and you get a week's free trial. So if you haven't had a go, go and have a look at that. Have your week's free trial. And if you like it, you could consider uh, upgrading to the premium content. And so the reason that the website is relevant to this video is because I'm using it to find out all the places where people make mistakes and when they don't realize they're making mistakes. So very often you'll make a mistake and then you'll mark it, you realize it's wrong. That's fine, right? You realize you've made a mistake. You can go back, hopefully correct that, hopefully see where it was that you went wrong. But what we find often on the website, there are certain questions where people have got it wrong and then they leave a comment saying that the, the answer that we've given is wrong, okay? Even, even when the answer that we've given is correct. So people are making mistakes, but are completely convinced that they've got it right. Okay, so I want to make sure that you're not making those same mistakes. And there seems to be like a few kind of key questions where this just comes up repeatedly. The same questions that people keep making the same mistakes on, but, but they're convinced that they haven't made a mistake. We've had nearly 20,000 people sign up this year. As you can imagine, that, that means we've had hundreds of thousands of questions answered, which means we've got lots of really good data that we can use to help you to do better in your exam. So I'm going to go through seven of these, you know, questions that people commonly get wrong without realizing and broadly speaking I'm going to start with what I think are the easier ones and then progress through to the harder ones but most of these are relevant to the foundation and the higher paper. So let's have a look at the first one. I think this one is actually really easy to correct because I think it mainly comes up as a result of not having read the question properly and it's the kind of questions where you're asked to leave the answer in its simplest form. So that could be uh, when your answer is a fraction and you need to simplify that down as far as possible. It could be when your answer is a ratio and you're asked to simplify that. Um, it could be when you're dealing with certs and you need to simplify those as well. But very often the GCSE question is going to ask you to simplify your answer as far as possible. Or it might say leave it in its lowest form. OK, so let me I'll just quickly go through one of those so you, so you see what I mean. This question is asking us to simplify the ratio 18 to 24 as much as possible. So you might notice that you could divide both of those by 2, for example. And that would give us 9 to 12. Now people will often stop at this stage because we can't divide both of those by 2. But you need to check whether both of those numbers can be divided by something else. And in this case, both of them can be divided by 3. 9 divided by 3 is 3, 12 divided by 3 is 4. Now we've simplified it as much as possible. So that's the first one, nice easy one to correct. After you've done the question, just go back, reread it, make sure if it's said to leave it in its simplest form or in its lowest form that you did that. The next one, number two on my list, is all to do with averages. And this is where you need to find the median, in particular where you're finding the median from a table. Okay, let's have a look at one of those questions. So in this question, we're being asked to find the median test score. And you can see we've got this table here. And then the frequency is telling us how many people got those particular scores in the test. So we've got six people who got a score of six in the test. We've got four people who got a score of seven, four people who got a score of eight, three people who got a score of nine, and three people who got a score of 10. The first thing we'll want to do is to add the frequency up. That'll tell us how many people took this test. So six, add four, add four, add three, add three is 20. So there are 20 people. Now, imagine those 20 people standing in a row. So there are the 20 people who took this test. Now the median is just the score 
of the person in the middle. The problem is, if you've got 20 people, there isn't somebody standing in the middle. You've got two groups of 10, and there isn't somebody standing in the middle whose score we could say would be the median. So what we do is we take the halfway point of the scores of these two people. So that's the 10th person, that's the 11th person, and we take the score halfway in between them. Now people sometimes use a formula, they'll say that it is the number of people, add one, divided by two. In our case, we've got the frequency, the total frequency is 20, so we would do 20, add one, which is 21, divided by two, which is 10 and a half. And that's what we found, isn't it? We want in between the 10th and the 11th, so the 10 and a half person, if you like, in this example. So we need to find the score of the 10th person and the score of the 11th person, and then we're going to take the halfway point between those two. So looking at our table, the first six people have got a test score of six, and then the next four, so up to the 10th person, they got a test score of seven, and then the 11th person is in that next group. The 11th person was in the group that got a test score of eight. So the 10th person is in that group that got a score of seven. The 11th person is in the group that got a score of eight. So the median is going to be the midpoint of seven and eight. And if you want to find the midpoint, in this case, it's, it's easy, isn't it? Seven and a half is halfway between seven and eight. But if you end up with numbers where it's not obvious, you can just add the two numbers together and divide it by two. So seven out of eight is 15 divided by two is seven and a half. We knew that anyway, but that is a method that you can use that will work when the numbers aren't good for you, okay? So even though none of the groups had a test score of seven and a half, it is true to say that the median is seven and a half. So the next one is to do with solving quadratic equations. And very often people understand that they need to factorize those, which is brilliant, but then there's another step as well after you factorized it in order to solve it. Let's have a quick look at one of those. Solve x squared plus 8x add 15 is equal to 0. So we know that we're going to have to factorize this to solve it. So we're looking for a pair of numbers that multiply to 15 and add to 8. So that is going to be 3 and 5. So x add 3 and x add 5. Now what people often do is they think they are finished there and they'll say that x is 3 or x is 5. But that is incorrect, so we mustn't do that. The next step is that we say, well, either x add 3 is equal to 0, in which case x is equal to minus 3, or x add 5 is equal to 0, in which case x is equal to minus 5. So x is equal to minus 3 or minus 5, and people often forget to do that last step. Reverse percentages comes up all the time on the website with people making mistakes on these. And, you know, over my years of teaching and tutoring, I've seen this come up time and time again. It's a really easy one to slip up on, okay? What people will typically do, incidentally, this could come up foundation or higher. It doesn't seem to come up so often in the foundation, but it could. Um, so what people tend to do, well, I'll tell you what, let's have a look at a question and I'll show you what people get wrong. In a sale, normal prices are reduced by 12%. The sale price of a DVD player is £242. So it was more expensive. It's been reduced in the sale by 12% down to 242 And we're being asked to work out the normal price of the DVD player. Now, what people will often do is to just find 12% of 242 and add that on, okay? And that is not the way to do this. You'll get a wrong answer if you do that. The way to do it is to imagine with the full price, the original full price, that was 100%. Okay, we always think of the original, the, the full price, the original item as being 100%, and they reduced that by 12%. So if it was 100% and we reduce it by 12%, 100%, take away 12% is 88%. And the price when it's been reduced by 12% is £242. So if you've got a calculator, one way you can do this is just to divide both sides by 88. That will tell you what 1% is. And 242 divided by 88 is £2.75. And then we can multiply that up by 100 to get back to the original amount, the 100%. That way we end up with 100% here, £2.75 times 100 is 275 
So the original price was £275. And you can check that because if you find out what 12% of £275 is, subtract it, you will end up with £242. So the next one is one that can come up when you're answering questions to do with Pythagoras, you know, when you're trying to find missing lengths of a triangle, but it could also come up when you're using the cosine rule in the higher paper, and it is people forgetting to do the square root of the number at the end. Let me quickly show you what I mean. So this question is to do with Pythagoras, okay? So I'm gonna label the triangle. Now we label the two shorter sides as A and B. So let's call that A, we call this B, even though they've called it X, I'm just gonna call it B, the hypotenuse we label as C. So we think of Pythagoras' theorem as A squared add B squared is equal to C squared. So let's just substitute in our numbers. We've got 9.6 squared add B squared is equal to 12.3 squared. So I'm gonna evaluate those. I'm gonna actually work out what those numbers squared are. So that's 92.16 add B squared is equal to 151.29 so if I subtract 92.16 from both sides, that will tell me that B squared, which is the length we're after, is 59.13. And people will often put the answer as 59.13, but there's a final step. You must find the square root of 59.13. That is a bit that people often miss out, okay? So the square root of 59.13 is 7.68. Eight, nine, rounded to one decimal place as we're being asked to do, that is 7.7. .7. So very often a question is gonna ask you to round off the answer. So first of all, just rounding is gonna come up in a number of questions. So if you're not confident with your rounding, do practice that. And as I say, head over to Maths Kitchen, have a look through the topics for rounding and get stuck into some of those questions. But there are also some very specific places where people often seem to go wrong. So let me show you one of those. So we're being asked to work out the length x and round our answer to two decimal places. So this is a trigonometry question, but the purpose of me showing it to you is not really to do a trigonometry. So I'm going to quickly work this answer out. So that tells us that x is 3.60345 and so on. That number continues but we're being asked to round the answer to two decimal places. Now to two decimal places, that's 3.60, but people will often just put 3.6. But if we've been asked to round to two decimal places, we must leave both of those in. It must be 3.60, not just 3.6. You know, we could even say there, we've rounded that to two decimal places. That shows that we have rounded it to two decimal places, even though, of course, the value of 3.6 and 3.60 is identical. But this is showing that we've definitely rounded to two decimal places, and you must do that. And then the final one I want to look at is to do with standard form. It's where people have nearly got it right, but they just made a little mistake. They've written an answer that looks like standard form, but actually isn't quite in standard form. Let me show you one of those. So this one, find the value of 3.2 times 10 to the power of 6, times four times 10 to the power of two. So the way I'm gonna calculate this, I'm gonna do 3.2 times four times 10 to the power of six times 10 to the power of two. Okay, so 3.2 times four, that is 12.8. 10 to the power of six times 10 to the power of two is 10 to the power of eight. So we got a number that looks like it's in standard form, but it's not because this number should be between one and 10. So people will often get to this point and think that they're finished, but you've got a little bit extra to do. This is correct, the value of this is correct. It's just not written in standard form. So this first number must be between one and 10. So we need to change that to 1.28. That's got 10 times smaller. So we need to multiply it by something that is 10 times bigger. And we do that by increasing this index number by one. So this not standard form, this is standard form, and that's what you're aiming for. So those are simple mistakes that people are making, and as I say, they are mistakes that people don't realize they're making. So maybe that's you, maybe you know one or two of those mistakes are mistakes that you have made in the past, hopefully from watching this and then subsequently doing some practice, those won't be mistakes that you make in the exam, and it may well, you know, you pick up a few marks like that, uh, and that might make the difference between, you know, going from one level to the next. You add all these little things together and it ends up making a big difference. So as I say, practice, practice, practice. Of course, get over to mathskitchen.com, check out the topics and practice some of those questions. 
and do the daily workout as well. But um, have a look at last week's video because I talk about all sorts of other free uh, resources that are available for you as well. So not just masskitchen.com. Right, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Thank you for watching. Thank you if you've used the website. Thank you if you've left feedback for us. That's incredibly helpful. It's really helped to make the website much, much better than it was. Um, do subscribe if you haven't already done so. Give the video a like and I will see you in the next video.